the word consciousness means a whole lot of different things to, uh, to different people. You come to a conference like this and they say, yeah, I'm giving a theory of consciousness, I'm giving a theory of consciousness. And you find they're quite often given theories of, of different things. Before, it was regarded as kind of not a suitable subject for science and not really for philosophy. It was more for mystics and, and religious people and so on. But it was not part of the real scientific world and certainly wasn't part of the scientific agenda. Now, that has changed dramatically. There has been an enormous increase in interest in the brain and in particular in what I think is the central question, namely, how does the brain produce consciousness? For instance, with pain, I first thought about this a long time when this got me involved, in fact, in this issue. I had this bad toothache. You lie in bed and you say, why, why does it actually hurt? So you say, well, you know what happens, the trigeminous nerve, you know, the, is, the tooth is decaying. So that excites the trigeminous nerve. It goes up here and ultimately goes to part of the brain you call the anterior cingulate in cortex. And so there, there some neuron will fire in response to that. So what? I mean, after all, this is just some ions squishing around here. I mean, so now I have sodium, potassium, and calcium solution up there, so why does it hurt? Some neurons over here, if they do the same thing, they give me pleasure. Some neurons over here give me, you know, the blue bird or a symphony of Beethoven, okay? So ultimately, I, ha I, have, this, I have this trouble that I, there's a physical system here of neurons and synapses and even quantum gravity, if I believe it, okay? But it's a physical system, and it's utterly unclear why this physical system should have these things called subjective states. You see, the real change that came over us in the 17th century is not just that we got Newton and uh, Darwin and Einstein uh, in the 17th century and subsequently, but that we demystified the universe. This is that key idea. This is the main contribution. And the point is, suppose it should turn out that God exists, that, uh, that uh, God exists and attaches the soul to the brain. Then that would be a fact of physics and biology like any other. That's the point about the demystification of the world, is that we regard the world as an intelligible place. And the only reason that it's not in, always intelligible to us is because we don't understand something or it's beyond our limited brain, but there's no built-in mystery. There's nothing that is inherently unintelligible in the universe. Initially, with publishing of Origin of Species and then Descent of Man, uh, there was a lot of concern, a lot of debate about what did this mean for the understanding of human nature and what did this help us to understand about phenomena like religion and, and so on. But believers soon found ways of reconciling uh, their um, religious faith with Darwinism. Humanists found it easy to reconcile their, uh, their faith with, uh, with Darwinism. Uh, and one of the principal ways was arguing that, the, yes, the human brain may have been the product of evolution, but the, with that brain came certain faculties of reason and thought and imagination, uh, moral sense, that had transcended um, whatever biological purposes or whatever biological functions had accounted for its, its evolution. I think that um, with the rise of molecular biology, and then following from molecular biology the rise of, of ethology and sociobiology, that there's been the effort to try to bring mind and culture back into the, the biological sphere and to try to extend Darwinism uh, to mind and culture. The study of the relationship between brain and mind uh, is probably the last frontier of the life sciences. We know that the mind is the brain. We know that to a moral certainty. We know that just as clearly that we know as we know that DNA is the physical substrate for, for reproduction. Now the trick is to work out all the little details, and there are many, and they are difficult, about how this can be. But we're, the pieces are falling into place very fast. The question then is whether or not we will come to see changes in our understanding of humans and ourselves that are comparable to the changes that we've seen elsewhere in science. And if those changes come about, how will that have an impact on how we interact with each other? The consequences for humans, I think, in the long run, will be at least as great as the Copernican Revolution, uh, because we will be able to uh, put our hands, for good or for ill, on the levers of control of the cognitive engine within.